You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. The people seemed mortified and downcast, and no doubt came to the conclusion that the rebellion lacked a good deal in being crushed out. Everything that could be of use to our army was impressed by our authorities, such as wagons, horses, shoes, sugar, molasses, whiskey, flour, leather, beef, cattle, and etc., It is said that many hundreds of fine cattle have been driven across the Potomac to be used by our army when we return to Virginia. I saw fine wagons and teams pass us in the road, taken in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Our army is now entirely subsisted on its enemy. This day we crossed the boundary between Maryland and Pennsylvania and marched 10 miles into Pennsylvania, passing through some pretty villages and towns. Here our men feasted on cherries, which the country affords the greatest abundance. They no doubt wishing to retaliate on the enemy for all their excesses committed in the South. At the same time, such conduct is prohibited by the authorities. Private William L. Daniel, 2nd South Carolina Infantry, Kershaw's Brigade, Longstreet's Corps. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the 310th episode of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. As y'all recall, at the end of the last show, we were talking about Jeb Stewart, and we'll start this episode by getting him started on his famous, or infamous, ride. At about 1 a.m. on June 25th, 1863, in the village of Salem, Virginia, Stewart made a final survey of the long, dark columns of mounted troops awaiting his word of command. When he gave that word, he and three of his five brigades of Confederate cavalry galloped away from the Army of Northern Virginia and went off on a ride that would become one of the Gettysburg Campaign's most enduring controversies. After the battles in Loudoun Valley at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville, Stuart had proposed this ride around the enemy army, and Robert E. Lee had liked the idea. After all, Stuart had successfully pulled off two such rides the previous year, during the Peninsula Campaign in June, and then again in October following the Maryland Campaign. Now, though, Lee had reminded his cavalry chief that his primary responsibility was to screen the right flank of the Army of Northern Virginia as it moved into Pennsylvania. But if Stuart believed he could accomplish this by passing around the Yankees and then linking back up with the Army in Pennsylvania, then he was permitted to do so. After receiving Lee's largely discretionary orders, Stuart prepared for the operation. As per Lee's instructions, he was leaving behind two of his brigades under Beverly Robertson and Grumble Jones to continue to screen the Army's advance north and protect its supply lines south. Then, with his three remaining brigades, led by his capable subordinates, Wade Hampton, Fitz Lee, and John Chambliss, Jeb Stewart set out on what would prove to be his most famous, or infamous, ride. 
As it turned out, those three brigades and Stuart himself would be out of contact with Robert E. Lee for the next seven days, much longer than either Lee or Stuart had ever anticipated, and Stuart and his men wouldn't link back up with the army until July 2nd, the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. In the days leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg, there's no doubt Stuart's absence would be deeply felt by Lee. Stuart's critics later claimed he left Lee blind, causing the Confederate Army commander to stumble into a battle at Gettysburg without a clear idea of either the lay of the land or even the whereabouts of the Union Army. Stuart's defenders counter by arguing that he had carried out, or at least attempted to carry out, all that Lee had instructed of him, and pointing out that the two brigades of horsemen Stuart left behind should have been enough to provide Lee with sound intelligence. Well, at any rate, the bottom line is that we'll never know if things might have turned out differently if Stuart hadn't went off on his ride. But what we do know is that the controversy surrounding Jeb Stuart's journey to Gettysburg certainly remains one of the campaign's most enduring controversies. Just as he did for Robert E. Lee, Jeb Stewart is going to drop off our radar for a while, at least here on the regular episodes of the podcast. We'll continue our coverage of his ride over on the members' episodes on Patreon, but now we're going to turn our attention to the advance of the rest of the Confederate Army into Pennsylvania. As y'all know, as the Army of Northern Virginia entered Pennsylvania, Yule's Corps would have the lead again proceeding up the Cumberland Valley, which was the northern extension of the Shenandoah. Conveniently for the invading Confederates, the Cumberland Valley curved northeastward and increasingly east so that Yule could follow it in a great right-turning arc. That movement would take Yule's troops all the way to the Susquehanna River, on the far bank of which stood Harrisburg, the Pennsylvania state capital. Lee told Yule, quote, If Harrisburg comes within your means, capture it. As Yule's command advanced toward Harrisburg, A.P. Hill's corps would follow behind him, and James Longstreet's corps would bring up the rear. Robert E. Lee himself crossed the Potomac River with the Virginians of Pickett's division of Longstreet's corps on a bleak and rainy June 25th but he was nevertheless greeted on the far shore by a collection of secessionist Maryland ladies who clustered under their umbrellas and waved their handkerchiefs in welcome. The last of Longstreet's troops crossed the Potomac on June 26th, and by the following day had reached Chambersburg up in Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, Yule's Corps, spearheading the invasion, had been busy, Busy not just marching, but also foraging. In fact, as it advanced toward Harrisburg through southern Pennsylvania, Yule's Corps, at Robert E. Lee's direction, was engaged in a massive supply-gathering operation. Back when we talked about Lee's reasons for wanting to assume the aggressive and march north, we said that one of his goals was to take the conflict out of war-ravaged Virginia and provide his army with food, forage, horses, and other supplies from the rich agricultural countryside of Pennsylvania. We also said that in a future episode, we'd talk more about the logistical concerns that prompted Lee to want to get his army out of war-ravaged central Virginia. And, well, this is that episode. It's important to understand that the Army of Northern Virginia had suffered from severe shortages of supplies all through the winter of 1862-63. The shortages were mostly a result of few manufactured goods being available for the Army and a woefully inadequate supply system in the Confederacy. Clothing and shoes were desperately needed, yet difficult to obtain. Worse than that, the supply of fodder for the army's horses and mules ran out in the early months of 1863. 
In February, one officer reported that large numbers of horses in his division were dying every day due to, quote, want of food and disease, end quote. Because of this crisis, Lee scattered his mounted units and many, many artillery batteries to distant areas behind the lines to allow them the opportunity to find fodder. Equally worrisome had been the supply of food for the men. Virginia had virtually run out of surplus food for Lee's army. Shipments of food by railroad from North Carolina and farther south were notoriously unpredictable and inadequate. The Confederate government informed Lee that winter that meat rations had to be reduced. Lee refused to implement this suggestion, instead demanding that the government respond to the crisis by providing his army with more food. He refused to reduce his men's rations and thus quickly ran out of food. By April 1863, the rebel soldiers were forced to exist on a ration of one-fourth pound of salted meat a day. That's just four ounces, when the official daily ration at the start of the war was 12 ounces of pork or bacon, or 20 ounces of fresh or salted beef. The miserably poor rations led to another problem, sickness. By the end of March, scurvy had become widespread, and Dr. Lafayette Guild, the Army's medical director, was ordering his personnel to aid the men in collecting all sorts of vegetables and wild greenery to supplement their meager diets. To try to address the problem of food and forage, Lee detached two divisions of Longstreet's Corps to southeastern Virginia in April to collect supplies. As you guys know, this detached duty, born of desperation, is why Longstreet and those two divisions miss the Battle of Chancellorsville in May. By the spring of 1863, it was apparent to Lee that feeding and equipping his men and feeding his horses and mules represented his most urgent challenge. In the wake of Chancellorsville, the lack of supplies reached crisis proportions. Robert E. Lee faced nothing less than the looming collapse of his army unless he could shift the scene of the action and take the conflict out of war-ravaged central Virginia. It was in the midst of that desperate logistical crisis that Pennsylvania beckoned, not only as the site of a potentially war-winning battle for the Confederacy, but as a land of plenty where the Army of Northern Virginia might find abundant supplies of food and forage. As Hill's Corps and Longstreet's Corps crossed the Potomac and followed them, Ewell's troops led the way up the Cumberland Valley. The divisions of Robert Rhodes and Allegheny Johnson kept to the main road, marching through Greencastle up to Chambersburg. Meanwhile, the advance of Jubal Early's division paralleled the other two on roads lying a bit farther east, on the very edge of the valley. Leading the way for Ewell's march, out in front of the Confederate infantry, Albert Jenkins' cavalry brigade introduced Pennsylvanians to the concept of a hostile army in their midst. Their dramatic entrances into various towns of the Cumberland Valley immediately cowed the quiet civilians. Shippensburg resident John Stumbaugh wrote to his son, a rebel horseman, charging through the streets, quote, with the most awful yells you ever heard, after Jenkins' horsemen came the Confederate infantry, swinging along with the jaunty stride, then the artillery, and finally the wagons, all in a column that Stumbaugh guessed must have been five miles long. Everywhere, Ewell's troops were busy plundering the wealth of the Cumberland Valley. By the time it reached Chambersburg, the Corps had collected such a surplus that a special wagon train was started back toward the south, bearing the spoils. As his army had prepared to cross the Potomac, Robert E. Lee had issued General Orders No. 72 for the dual purpose of 1. Prohibiting damage or destruction of private property, and 2. 
authorizing only certain officers to seize it. On one hand, this order, admonishing his troops not to plunder northern civilians, was designed to make the Confederacy appear more virtuous than the Union armies, who were plundering their way across the South. However, another definite purpose of Lee's orders was to organize the efficient collection of supplies and goods by designated officers for the entire army's benefit. The orders gave detailed instructions to the chiefs of the commissary, quartermasters, ordnance, and medical departments on procedures for acquiring supplies from the enemy's country. Lee empowered them to make requisitions upon local authorities or civilians and to pay the market price for whatever they took. But if the local authorities or civilians refused to honor these requisitions or failed to meet their quotas, the officers could seize the supplies without payment of cash. In such cases, they would give the owner a receipt specifying the kind, amount, and market price of the property taken. Although these regulations were designed to prevent lawless confiscation of property, they naturally gave civilians no real choice in the matter of seizures. In addition, with regard to compensation, the officers were to offer either 1. Payment in Confederate paper currency, which needless to say, was worthless in the North, or 2. As an alternative, a claim on the Confederate government to be honored in the future, which of course would only be worth something if the Confederacy won the war. Actually, under the circumstances, we don't think the citizens of Pennsylvania could have had a fairer arrangement to compensate them, even if Lee's motivation wasn't a humanitarian one. Lee wanted to make sure the seizure of the region's bounty was done efficiently and for the benefit of the whole army. And he also knew that wanton and indiscriminate pillaging and destruction by Confederate soldiers would lead to a breakdown of discipline and reduce the combat effectiveness of the army. For those reasons, Lee's generals cooperated in enforcing his orders, and not because they were kindly disposed toward the inhabitants of south-central Pennsylvania. In reality, though, Lee's orders, warning his men to be on their good behavior and to act as invited guests in an enemy land, well, that was demanding the impossible. As a correspondent of the Richmond Sentinel newspaper observed, quote, You cannot possibly introduce an army for one hour into an enemy's country without damaging private property, and in a way often in which compensation cannot be made. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I'd like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan, and we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. 
Every week we tackle fascinating topics. We go back to source materials in their original languages. And we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. When General Lee warned his men to be on their good behavior and act as invited guests in an enemy land, he gave them no inkling of the bountiful and strange country they were about to enter. Most of them had never seen anything like it before. The vast majority of those serving in the ranks of the Army of Northern Virginia had never crossed the Mason-Dixon line, and so now were getting their first look at storied Pennsylvania. They gawked at the fertile farmlands and well-maintained orchards of the Cumberland Valley. The massive Pennsylvania bank barns were particular objects of marvel. These barns were so named because they were built into hillsides or had a bank of earth to serve as a ramp to provide access to the upper level. They were substantially more imposing than their southern counterparts. One Georgian noted that, quote, A Dutchman's pride is in his large, well-filled barns. And just as a side note, but many of the inhabitants of this part of Pennsylvania were of Germanic descent, and the Confederate soldiers invariably referred to them as Dutch. So that explains that rebel soldier's reference to a Dutchman. Actually, rather than thinking they were really Dutch, the word is probably a corruption of Deutsch, which means German. But at any rate, even today, if you are from this region, I can personally attest you still know about the Pennsylvania Dutch. But to get back to the matter at hand, Lieutenant William Lyon, an ordnance officer in Yule's Corps, wrote that during the march up into Pennsylvania, he passed through, quote, the most beautiful and highly cultivated country that I ever saw it was literally a land of plenty. End quote. While marching through this land of plenty, which was an enemy's country, many Confederate soldiers paid little heed to Robert E. Lee's instructions. Colonel William C. Oates, commander of the 15th Alabama, wrote We marched into Pennsylvania that afternoon and went into camp before night south of Greencastle. I, with Adjutant Waddle, rode out into the country and found some of the soldiers committing depredations upon the Dutch farmers, which I promptly rebuked, and ordered the men to camps wherever we found them. This was done in obedience to General Lee's order forbidding interference with private property, because it was wrong and should never be done, even in an enemy's country, except when absolutely necessary. But as far as I saw, these depredations extended only to taking something to eat and burning fence rails for fuel. Some men would do this when they had plenty of rations in camp. At one house, we found some of our regiment milking the cows and catching the milk in canteens, which seemed to be very expert work of that kind. One rebel admitted, quote, The officers in command issued stringent orders with reference to private property, but the soldiers paid no more attention to them than they would the cries of a screech owl. The men of Yule's Corps, in the lead, had the best opportunities for pillaging, but their comrades coming along behind were just as industrious. A private in Hood's division of Longstreet's Corps, near the tail end of the invading army, noted that when his regiment made camp for its first night in Pennsylvania, quote, Many of the men went into the countryside foraging, returning, some with chickens, some with honey, some with butter, and whatever else that was edible on which their hands could be laid. We notice that as you read through accounts of the Confederate invasion of Pennsylvania, you come across story after story having to do with either cherries horses, or hats. For example, an Alabaman recalled, quote, It was at a season of the year when the trees drooped with ripening cherries, and in every direction you could see these trees filled with Confederate soldiers helping themselves to that most luscious fruit, 
Then, as the Confederates marched up into Pennsylvania, it's no exaggeration to say they took every horse they could find in town and countryside. Captain William Seymour of Harry Hayes' Louisiana Brigade commented upon the lengths the locals would go to conceal their animals. Seymour wrote that, quote, horses were found in bedrooms, parlors, lofts of barns, and other out-of-the-way places. Seymour told the story of how one day the brigade quartermaster was questioning the owner of a large and finely furnished house when he heard a neigh from the next room. Quote, the major quietly opened the door, and there, in an elegant parlor, comfortably stalled in close proximity to a costly rosewood piano, stood a noble-looking horse. And then there were hats. Besides taking every horse they could find, the Confederates also seemingly appropriated every hat they could lay their hands upon. The average rebel soldier apparently entered Pennsylvania in desperate need of new headgear. For example, as Hood's division marched through Greencastle, a hatless soldier of the 4th Alabama saw a man and two women standing at a fence, watching the passing Confederate column. As he proceeded past the trio, the soldier snatched the hat from the man's head and kept right on marching. A few yards farther along, another Alabaman played the same trick on an elderly gent, grabbing the man's new felt hat while dropping his own well-worn cap at the man's feet. As the rebel soldiers marched on, they could hear, much to their amusement, the old man declaring, I really believe that soldier has taken my hat. However, at other times, the plundering took on a more serious tone. In his book, Beneath a Northern Sky, A Short History of the Gettysburg Campaign, Stephen E. Woodworth shares the story of a tense exchange that took place as the 16th Mississippi was halted in one of the streets of Chambersburg. Private Bill Phipps saw a large civilian, about his size, standing in front of a house. Phipps thought the Pennsylvanian didn't look sufficiently impressed at having an invading army on his doorstep, and so he abruptly demanded, "'Come out of that hat, and don't say you ain't in there, for I see your legs sticking out from under it.'" As Woodworth continues telling the story, the civilian bristled, responding, I'll come out of it when you are man enough to make me. Phipps was not inclined to measure physical prowess with the Pennsylvanian, so he loaded his rifle, cocked it, and aimed it at the unarmed civilian's chest. The man hastily threw the hat to the ground. There, take it, he spat. The Lord knows you need it, and a lot more clothes besides, you ragged rebel. Phipps kept his gun pointed at the now hatless civilian's midsection and demanded, Come out of that coat. I won't pull off my coat for any man except to fight him. You can take your choice of pulling it off alive, replied Phipps coolly, or have me pull it off you when you're dead. The civilian gave in and tossed his coat on the ground next to his hat as the whole 16th Mississippi seated or lying in the street, looked on with amusement. Phipps was not finished. Come out of them breeches, he snarled. I demand the protection of an officer, exclaimed the civilian. I appeal to the captain or commanding officer of this company to save me from the disgrace of disrobing on the street. There were plenty of officers on the scene, but they all pretended not to hear. I don't care a pickled damn about your being naked in the street, said Phipps. I want them breeches. Finally, the civilian and the gray-clad highwayman worked out a compromise. They both went into the man's house, and Phipps emerged dressed in a complete suit of stolen clothes. Another story, which the men delighted in retelling, involved Robert E. Lee himself. Lee was riding along one day, so the story goes, when he came upon 30 or 40 Confederate soldiers staging a bold assault on the feathered population of a roadside farm. 
It was a noisy affair, with ducks, geese, turkeys, and chickens squawking in terror, and soldiers howling in delight, while the old lady of the place was screaming for them to stop. Catching sight of Lee, the frantic woman recognized him, perhaps from published pictures, and began shouting, General Lee, General Lee, I wish to speak to you, sir. Lee, however, merely kept his eyes straight ahead, touched the brim of his hat, and said, Good morning, madam. A South Carolina soldier reported that this, quote, caused a great deal of amusement as the old lady, panting with anger, was compelled to witness the departure of her last chicken and the old family gobbler. We wanted to be sure to point out that, in most respects, the Confederate army that marched through Pennsylvania was no better or worse than the Union armies that marched through various parts of the South at different times during the war. The tales of rebel plundering really only merit comment because they're part of the story of the Gettysburg campaign, and because there's the novelty that the large-scale pillaging and foraging are happening in a northern state for the first time in the war. But Union soldiers that marched through the Confederacy were certainly no angels. A federal sergeant in one of the western armies advancing into the heart of Dixie admitted in a letter home that, quote, Our men has no mercy whatever. Take anything they can lay their hands on. Leave the country bare wherever they go. The houses near the road suffer the most. I have seen women crying and begging for them to leave a little for the children, but their tears were of no avail. Some of our soldiers are a disgrace to the service. Union soldiers marching through the South were no angels, but a particularly shameful and outrageous aspect of Confederate conduct in Pennsylvania that receives little mention in most histories of the Gettysburg Campaign is the rebel army's kidnapping of blacks and carrying them off into slavery. Precise numbers are hard to come by, but indications are that Confederate troops captured and dragged off perhaps as many as several hundred black Pennsylvanians, many of them freeborn. The practice of rounding up blacks was widespread and never condemned by any level of the Confederate high command. Whether or not it was officially sanctioned, the kidnapping of blacks was without question officially tolerated. Longstreet himself instructed one of his division commanders, George Pickett, to make sure to bring along the captured blacks when he marched to Gettysburg. The abduction started as soon as Lee's soldiers reached free soil. Jenkins' rebel horsemen, leading the way, searched Chambersburg for blacks, most of whom had been born free and had spent all their lives there. A Union soldier's wife, Rachel Cormany, a white resident of the town, wrote of seeing the local blacks, quote, driven by just like we would drive cattle. Cormany noted that most of those caught were women and children, and that, quote, one woman was pleading wonderfully with her driver for her children, but all the sympathy she received from him was a rough march along. When another white Chambersburg resident, Mrs. Jemima Cree, argued with a Confederate officer whose men had kidnapped her freeborn black employee, he replied that he could do nothing because orders were orders. According to Mrs. Cree, the rebels were taking, quote, all they could find, even little children, whom they had to carry on horseback before them. Many blacks hid in the woods or in the houses of employers, but it appears about 250 African-American residents of Chambersburg were rounded up and sent off into bondage in the South. The story was much the same in other towns. In Mercersburg, for example, Professor Philip Schaeff recorded in his diary that, quote, public and private houses were ransacked, horses, cows, sheep, and provisions stolen without mercy, Negroes captured and carried back into slavery, even such as I know to have been born and raised on free soil 
end quote. It should go without saying that under no circumstances could the Confederates justify the abduction of African Americans on grounds of military necessity. During the invasion of Pennsylvania, the kidnapping of blacks by Lee's army, especially of freeborn blacks, is simply disgraceful and reprehensible. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is At the Forefront of Lee's Invasion, Retribution, Plunder, and Clashing Cultures on Richard S. Yule's Road to Gettysburg by Robert J. Winstra. We've noticed that a particular tendency among some Civil War books, and maybe it's with history books in general and not just Civil War books, but some Civil War books, they really um, go for the gusto with a subtitle. And Winstra's At the Forefront of Lee's Invasion is a prime example of the species with the subtitle of, take a deep breath, Retribution, Plunder, and Clashing Cultures on Richard S. Yule's Road to Gettysburg. Woo! Yeah, buddy. So I guess, remember, Tracy... If we ever write a Civil War book, we've got to come up with a really spiffy subtitle. Okay. Well, I'm not sure where to go with that, except to say that you can always find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. We have quite a few new members of the Strawfoot Brigade to thank this week. Danny, Bob, Richard, and Lee... Patrick, Caleb, Brendan, Logan, and Susan. And then we also want to thank Bob, Daryl, Bernard, Arthur, and Paul for their donations. We hope all of you know how much we appreciate your support, whether as a member on Patreon or through your generous donations on PayPal. We do. Uh, You know, Tracy and I both have our Monday through Friday day jobs, And then the many hours we spend working on the podcast are really a labor of love. It would be great if we, or at least one of us, could work on the podcast full time, but that just hasn't ever been possible yet. Uh, However, the financial support from your memberships and donations not only move us a bit closer to making that dream a reality, maybe, but also are a constant encouragement to us to keep on with the work of putting out the podcast. All of that's to say that for those of you who support the podcast, it means a lot to us. It does. And even if you just listen to the podcast, and I'm making air quotes around just, but that also means a lot because around the end of December, we passed 10 million total downloads for the podcast. And we thought that was kind of a big deal. Back when we reached 1 million downloads, I thought it was so funny when Tracy said, wow, a million of anything is a lot. So now I'll simply say, wow, 10 million of anything is a lot. It is. Well, uh, at least when it comes to a podcast we record at our dining room table, we think 10 million downloads is pretty darn cool. So really, all of that's to say that we mean it when we say thank you for listening to this episode and all the other episodes of the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope you join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.